June was, I've been asked by other professors to talk about the importance of free bodies and what happens in the industry, what you, what you need to know from undergraduate to professional in the world and, and what that all entails. So this is kind of the flyer we advertised for. Uh, just want to be clear that my employer is Boeing, although everything that I did today and that I'm going to talk about is independent of Boeing. So this is my personal opinions, views, perspectives, and that like. So just the disclaimer there. So here's kind of what I'm going to talk to you guys about, give you a little background on where I came from and what I've worked on there in industry, and then go through the important aspects that I want to convey today. So if you take anything away, there's really two things. One is the structural thought process. And this is what I use on a daily basis on how I actually analyze parts and how I start analysis. And then the last thing on there, the structural analysis day-to-day -day work. So I want to convey what we actually do in industry so that either A, you say you want to be a structural analysis engineer, B, you say you don't want to be one, or C, you say I don't know, it seems kind of cool. So today, really what I want this to be is kind of an informal discussion. I'll ask some questions. If you guys can answer them, they shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, the one, one thing, one of my models I live by now is you can't succeed until you fail. So if you ask me a question that I don't know, that's a good sign. Uh, if I ask you a question that you don't know, that's also a good sign. Uh, let's not get too into the details though. So here I'm going to talk about kind of the creative thinking ability. So this is really what makes an engineer. Um, this is kind of my definition of what makes a good engineer, is that creative thinking ability critical thinking ability, and then linking that to your actual technical understanding. So how do we get from, I'm kind of a creative individual to I went to school and learned all these theorems and equations, how do we bridge that gap and start to formulate in our heads what's actually going on from a structural analysis perspective? So again, I'll talk about this structural thought process in a little more detail. So here's my background. I did graduate from here in 2012 aerospace engineering, uh, math minor. Right now I'm taking graduate studies at Washington University. And then my work experience is all Boeing military, it's all F-15. I do have some other experience there at Boeing, but I'm really just gonna focus on the F-15 at this point because if you look in the top right, this is what I really do for the F-15. So from a general role, we kind of, we, we support three groups. We support our customers, our suppliers, and our assembly lines. This is for a production aircraft, okay? I'll get into the day-to-day -day stuff and what the difference is between a production aircraft, a clean sheet design, a redesign, research technology, that kind of stuff. So this aircraft has been around for 43 years now. So it's been flying a long time. We sold a lot of them, we've made a lot of them. They don't fall out of the sky just randomly. So we know when we analyze these things and we come up with results that say, hey, your, your wing's about to fall off, we know that there's some mistake we made in our analysis, whether that be an assumption, or we have bad loads, or just something in the analysis that we didn't account for. So the second uh, bullet there is I'm basically the program focal for the F-15 program from a methods, tools, and analysis perspective on structural analysis. So what, what I actually do at work is I work with a grade six structural engineer. Uh, grade six is as high as you can go in Boeing, as well as most companies technically. And I meet with them on a weekly basis and we talk about these issues that we have. Because analysis that we did back in, see, F-15 was designed in 1968. It flew in 1972. That's where the 43 years comes from. So the analysis we did back then was the analysis we knew how to do back then. A lot of hand stuff, a lot of scanned in hand work that we have to figure out and go through and document. But then nowadays we go back and we say, hey, we have a problem on a part. We need to analyze it. So we go back and look at the legacy analysis. Well, maybe that analysis is outdated. So we're gonna use new methods that we know. We're gonna update it. Maybe there's a new flight spectrum that we're analyzing to. And actually, it turns out what happened. The F-15 was designed to a certain flight spectrum, VN diagram, that kind of stuff. And now what we're finding is all of our customers we sell to are actually flying it to many, many more degrees higher than what it was actually designed to. So we have to be careful with that because from a legacy perspective, like I said, the airplane's not falling out of the sky, but these new analysis methods and tools we're using say it's gonna fall out of the sky. So 
we have to bridge that gap between legacy analysis and updated analysis and figure out where our conservatism is in the analysis and pull that out so that we can kind of benchmark and show positive margin when we know there's positive margin. So my experience is really dominated in hand analysis and hand methods. So there's a lot of equations that I've worked with. There's a lot of empirical data, charts, uh, plots that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And not so much in FEM. I do also use FEM at work. It's been more on a limited basis. Um, it's very important in certain aspects. We use two different types of FEMs to analyze parts. We use a uh, P-level element, and I believe it's an H-level element. So H-level is your standard ANSYS, uh, and NASTRAN, PATRAN, uh, Abacus, I believe, uses it. So then P-level is really, uh, it refers to the polynomial level of the element. So essentially a large element in a P-level is like a bunch of small elements in an H-level. Anyways, we use the two different FEMs to get uh, different analysis based on what we're actually looking to get out. Are we trying to get loads out of the model? Or are we trying to get stresses out of the model? Are we looking at KTs? Are we trying to grow a crack? That kind of stuff. So at any point, please stop me if you have a question and we can talk about it. Also, um, try to have some audience participation in terms of asking questions in the line. So don't be afraid to speak up. So, so if you go back yeah. to far, yeah. the airplane that's not the F-15 on that, what is that and why did you pick that picture? Okay, so this is the X-45, A and B. So Boeing made these, um, shoot, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, something like that. Anyways, one of the professors I work with at the university there, these are his kind of pride and joy. Um, a really cool aircraft, but, so I put those up there because it, it's a, this is kind of a Boeing military, so the different things that Boeing has done all of these analysis methods and topics I'm gonna to discuss apply to all of the Boeing military, which is actually heritage McDonnell Douglas. So yeah, that's the X-45, pretty cool aircraft. It's a UAV, does some cool stuff. Um, it actually can be flown by one pilot and there's four of them. So we had two virtual and two real. So we can talk more about that later too. Uh, then of course the F-15, um, I really like this picture. Again, these pictures are all public domain, just so you know. Uh, next year, hopefully, I can update these with some cooler pictures. Stuff. So I, I call the F-15 a, a fat cat, um, just because if you look at it, I mean, it looks pretty mean with all those weapons on it. It has great payload capability. Uh, it, it, it still is a, a very applicable fighter to today and, and what we use it for in terms of payload range. Um, and there's one more too, survivability. I think. So I think its record is. 104 to zero in combat, so a very capable aircraft, even though it was designed in 1968. So the structural thought process. I read an article the other day and it talked about every presentation, people only take away 10% of what's actually presented. So what that told me was I'm really smart because I take away about 50%. So uh, you have to stress the 10% message, right? So this is the 10% message I want you guys to get out of my presentation is the structural thought process. So what is the structural thought process I use to apply in my daily job that gets me to the next level? So that when I got a boss who comes to me, he says, hey Daniel, I really need you to look at this bulkhead. It's got an undercut in the lead. I'm not sitting there saying, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know how to analyze this. I don't know what's going on. I sit down and I go through the structural thought process and I plot it out, even no matter how much I don't know about what I'm supposed to be doing. If I go through this method, nine times out of 10, when I get done, I know exactly what I'm doing, or I can go to my lead or my manager and say, this is what I think I should do. This is what you want me to do, and go from there. So the kind of key bullets here is geometry, loading, and reaction. Those are really the three things that we focus on. So geometry, we have to know what the geometry is going on. So here I just drew a box beam for you guys. So this is my geometry for some analysis that you know I was given today. I'm gonna need to know what my loading is. So I go into uh, basically a file that tells me what my loadings are, where they're at. Maybe I go to a fin and pull loads out of there. And it determines that there's a pressure load on the, on the top of that box beam there. So now I have to look at how does this part interface with other parts? 
So where is the free action going to be? In this case, I just did a, a cantilever box beam for you guys. So this is the structural thought process I go through. Um, geometry, loading, and then how does it react? So reactions are really where what makes a good structural engineer. If you can make a valid free body given an applied load in the geometry, then you can essentially be that much more valuable to the company. And that's really what they want you to be able to do, especially at a lower level. Because if your boss is drawing your free bodies out all the time, he's not gonna like that. He has more important things to do. Uh, so they will if you need to, but, so here's an example I'm gonna go over with you guys. I actually have some other slides, but I wanted to put some loads on here myself by hand, ask some questions, but, so this is essentially a geometry with a vertical load on it. Um, I actually came across this in work, um, something very similar at least, and I had to figure out how to react this load. And when I went to my lead, I said, A, B, and C, and he said, wow, that's a great job. You know, Give me the report, I'll sign it. So uh, again, and that was all because I, I went through the structural thought process. So the last couple things to talk about I had a professor, one in particular that I remember here at Embry Riddle in dynamics, his name is Brad Wall. He came up with a step by step process on how to do an assignment or a, or a problem in his class. The ninth step of that process was does it make sense? This is probably most important of anything we do in engineering because we can crunch numbers, we can use computers, we can use tools all we want, but until we can actually make sense of what's going on, it's worthless. And so that's really what engineering is in the industry is here's some numbers here's some data make sense of it and then go to your manager the procurement people the vps and say this is what's going on so that they can go to the customer and we can sell our craft we can build our craft so the last couple things really uh along with does it make sense are if i make changes in my assumptions is that going to change my free body a lot and is it going to change my analysis a lot because if it does, perhaps I may not want to spend as much time in the analysis or do as detailed of an analysis. So if I need determined I need to build a fit with this thing, and I found out, hey, there's assumption A and B, and they're way too conservative, where if I change them ever so slightly, it's going to completely change my model, going to completely change my results. I'm not going to want to build a fit because it's going to take time to build a fit. So that's something we also consider. And in with that, you come up with alternative methods to use. So we say, this is my free body I came up with. I got a distributed load, so I know what's going to happen. At the reaction there is there's going to be a moment and a shear that's going to go on. And I'm going to probably do a section analysis on this beam. Maybe there's some fasteners in there. I need to determine what my fastener load is. I'm going to go in and do that. If I slightly change this to where I have different reactions in different places, maybe I'm looking at a different type of analysis. So that becomes more of like, here's my primary analysis, let me do a secondary analysis just to show I'm more critical for uh, you know, section analysis tripling on the, on the, uh, let's see, the lower side of this beam. So very important that we do that. After that, we actually determine the critical sections in the geometry and perform the analysis. So critical sections being where are my peak loads? Because you can do a section analysis on this beam at infinitely many spots. Well, you're not going to do infinitely many analysis because you know that the peak loading is at the reaction. So you're going to go into the reaction, you're going to do a section analysis there. So think about this. Um, I'll probably refer to it many times throughout, and this is really what I want you guys to think about, especially when we get into some examples and I walk you through the loading and kind of my thought process on, on how to work that problem to finish that problem. So that's the last thing. There's the actual reaction I drew it in there for you. Um, at this point, we can say that this is about a free body. I'll get into why that is. So undergraduate topics. This is what we teach here at Embry Riddle. These are the four main classes that apply to structures and the structural analysis that we do at work. Of course, there's always more. Uh, you can do detailed FEM stuff. You can do more failure analysis with fatigue. Of course, you can get into vibrations and acoustics. Uh, there's the, the structural analysis domain is very, very massive. And the one thing I've learned out of all of my work so far is how I only know one grain of a whole beach of potential. So that, that's how I think about what I actually know. And that's probably pretty accurate. So 
we got static solid mechanics, structures one, structures two. Um, some of these it doesn't look like you can really see, but I tried to bolt some text in different areas that I wanted to focus on. This is actually from the catalog. I went online and copied these out. But so in statics, you kind of learn about centroids, equilibriums, uh, rigid bodies, solid mechanics. We learn about actual mechanics of materials, so axial torsional bending, um, material properties, basic stress strain equations, the definition of strain, the definition of stress. If you notice, that's what some of these equations are up there. Um, excuse me. So you have your inertia equation up there. Uh, let's see, sigma is P over A. Epsilon, uh, your, your strain up there is delta over L. So some of these equations we learn. I'm going to get into how we actually use these equations and what we do. So then we actually start aerospace structures. Uh, I believe in here you, you do some fatigue work as well. You learn about beam bending, you learn about shear flows, and you, you get into finite element modeling as well, some computer aided analysis there. Uh, but really, we start to learn more about aerospace structures there, uh, torque boxes and, and section analysis. And so I don't think I put too many equations for that one up there. Um, but then in structures two, we learn more of our detail type analysis. So uh, I think we went over crippling, uh, we talked about buckling, uh, there's column buckling versus panel buckling. See, I think we studied uh, briefly vibrations, uh, virtual work, so how to determine overly constrained reactions and uh, overly constrained free bodies. So some of those other equations up there is like the tau crit and the p crit, so that's like a column buckling, the tau crit's more of a panel buckling. So again, these equations we have to be able to apply based on that structural thought process and how we get to that point of, okay, now I'm done, now I can actually apply an equation and come up with an allowable and write a margin of safety, safety against my applied mode. So here's some categories of structural analysis. I went through and basically listed off some of the major categories or types of analysis that I've done um, or that is being done on structures and, and will be, I guess, the tools and methods that we have available to us. So. I'm not going to talk to really too many of these here. Um, the asterisks on, on those topics over here, composites, fatigue, acoustics, and flutter, are really there because those areas are very, very broad, and there's a lot of specifics that goes into those actual analysis. At Boeing, we actually have specific teams that do fatigue, acoustics, and flutter, and they're all their own teams. So there's three teams to do three of those. And then composites are, uh, they're kind of an own animal in themselves. They have their own, I guess, region of analysis that we have to use on them. You have delamination analysis you can go through. Uh, not to mention you have ply by ply stress and strain as well as laminate versus lamina. Um, there's a, a bonded joint type of analysis where you actually look at the bonds of the composite to the metal. There's tons of analysis there in composites. So here's the first question of the day. I'll buy you lunch if you get it right. Which, which area here do you think I spend, I'd say about 70% of my time on at work? So there's there's two of these, and they're next to each other, and that's where I spend the majority of all my work going. Yeah. Fascinating. You got it. All right, I owe you lunch. <laughs> Faster splices of joints. So why is that? That's because all of our structure has to be connected somewhere. We don't have the capability to put a hunk of metal on a bat and pull out an airplane guy, which is unfortunate, but it keeps me employed, right? So faster and splices, they're highly nonlinear um, phenomena, and we have ways to deal with that. Uh, we have approximations, we have data, we do testing. That's the only way we can really analyze fasteners. Unless you want to build a detailed film, it's a nonlinear film, say an abacus, um, I know stress check will do it too, but basically a nonlinear contact film where you have geometry nonlinearities as well as material nonlinearities, that's really the only way you're going to capture a fastener and do a fastener analysis based on what your local stresses and loads are in that model. So any questions on some of these areas? I went over, uh, I'll talk to more of these. There's a couple that are very important. One is actually beams and section analysis. So actually the, this is kind of the foundation for everything I do as well. If you kind of think of everything in terms of a beam and applying a section analysis to it, chances are you're going to be pretty close to what your lead is going to want you to do. So 
the three topics I'm going to hit on, I'm actually going to talk about faster real quick today. But free bodies, uh, stiffness, and load path. Uh, we learn about these here at Edinburgh Riddle, but we don't quite have the pieces to put those together just yet uh, based on the equations that we know. So you see I put beams up here three times, so I think I'm trying to emphasize something there. Beams are very important. That's essentially in solid mechanics, when you learn about beams and they have all those tables of beams, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a book and looked those beam equations up, whether it's to come up with deflections or loads or distributions, whatever it may be. So beams are very important. We react things, we idealize them into a beam as, as much as possible. And it, that's really what free bodying is all about, is to take a detailed, complex part and interface and to make it into something simple like this is a cantilever beam with a tip load. So free bodies, we'll go over these here in a sec, uh, load paths and stiffness. So stiffness is really K equals P over delta. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to this in a, in a couple slides as to why this is so important and how we derive it. Um, I'm sure the professors know how we get to that equation and what K actually turns out to be for, say, like an axial member of a FEM. Um, but I'll touch on that and kind of remind you the importance of what that is. And you can actually do this in different, I guess, loading types from axial to bending to shear. Those are essentially the three different loading types we look at. So second question, is this a free body, this guy right here? You can just nod your head, yes or no. Don't look at the professor, that's definitely cheating. Yes or no, yes, no, maybe, yes. I, I see a couple yeses, a couple noes. So the answer is no, and the reason why it is not balanced. You have to balance it. Um, so most people in the industry don't care about this step, but I tell you what, it makes, makes you a better engineer if you do. Um, I've had some leads that I gave a presentation one time to about 15 other engineers there that were kind of newer engineers, teaching them about faster and faster analysis. When I got done with the presentation, a lead of mine that I, I don't work for anymore, he came up to me and he says, you know, it was a great presentation, but all your all your diagrams up there on fasteners, they weren't valid free bodies. I said, what do you mean? He said, they weren't fully balanced. So now you got stuff up there that's confusing people, right? Because you got too many loads drawn on, you're, you're saying things are getting induced here, you're saying this is an internal load, that's reaction. So this is an applied load. People can get confused because there's too much going on or there's too little going on. So always try and simplify your free bodies down into exactly what is applied, what is reacted. Sometimes that reaction is going to be an internal load, which you can specify, but just make sure you're not drawing different things. And what I mean by like an induced load would be, this tip load is basically a cantilever beam. And at some point in, in this guy, you'll have a section and you'll do a section analysis. And when you apply that moment to there, you're gonna have compression in the top, or sorry, um, tension in the top and compression in the bottom. So an induced load would be that moment distribution of axial load in the section. So if I were to draw this on that free body, that would probably confuse a lot of people who hadn't seen it before. So that's what we want to do in free bodies, make it very simple, very easy to understand and to follow. So another question, is this a free body? Yes, no, no? No, because the moment's not balanced. There's an eccentricity between the plates. So uh, we'll, I'll show you some free bodies and. Some of the pictures I'm going to draw are unbalanced free bodies because I want to show you the process of how to get to a balanced free body. So this is just kind of showing you load path, kind of how you think about it. Um, uh, load path is kind of an interesting term, I guess, because if you think about it, yeah, it's the path that the load is traveling, but it's really the, I guess, how the load is being reacted by the structure is how I tend to think about it. So really the load path here is you have an axial load path that has to come through, and this axial load basically has to follow this kind of red line through here. So that's a way to think about it. It's not exactly always the case, but it'll help you out if you think about kind of a flow in terms of, hey, I got a flow, and it's got to go this way to get through there, right? So beams, that's the last thing, just a reminder. We do everything in beams, right? So free body. <sighs> This is statics. I mean, this, you learn this, I think, in physics one at the end of it. Uh, we touched on it, and then in statics, you actually do a lot more free body. You 
learn how reactions, how we turn reactions versus pin versus clamp versus guided versus fixed. We learn about all these and what that means in terms of the reaction capability of the structure. And that's very important because in analysis, I may have a beam with a pressure load on it that's in between, say, two other beams that's supporting it. Well, that would essentially be a beam with a support on both ends, right? With a, a distributed load on it. If I'm doing an analysis of that beam, I'm probably gonna wanna do fixed constraints on the outside because that's gonna be more critical. Now, in reality, we'll have fasteners there. It's not gonna be a fully fixed constraint. If I'm looking at those fasteners, I'm gonna have to somehow come up with a way to do a simply supported beam and a fixed beam to come up with what those loads are at the joint because I'm actually looking at the joint versus if I'm just looking at that beam in a section analysis. And that's how we essentially function is we try to do the fastest approach we can to come up with a margin. If it's positive, great. If it fits our requirements, great. If it doesn't, we need to know how to pull out conservatism out of the analysis. We need to know why that is. Oftentimes that comes through in your constraints in the model. So what are you saying the structure can react versus in reality, what can the structure react? A lot of that comes from experience. Um, you just have to come through these pitfalls and fail a couple times on some free bodies and your leads tell you, this is not how it is. This is what really happens. And that, that's really how you have to learn and, and get through these. So in uh, structures, we always assume Newton's second law, right? F equals MA for constant mass equals zero. So we're assuming that there's no acceleration. So what this tells us is that every applied moment and force has to have a reaction of some kind. So that's what I always remember when I'm doing free bodies. Everything I apply to this model has to be reacted out. So all my six equations, if I'm doing three, 3D, three I got three forces, three moments, they have to balance in some way. This comes in handy when you're building FEMS. As I've seen build, people build FEMS, the FEMS are gonna run, unless you, you know, have some rigid body motion and get a micro strain, right? And, and get a singular matrix. But if you can get a non-singular matrix and a FEM, it's going to run and it's going to give you results. And you might not know what the heck they mean and think you do because you're like, oh yeah, you know, I built a FEM on that. And then your lead goes in and looks at your constraints and he said, well, looks like you fully fixed every panel or every edge on this panel and, and that's completely wrong. So you have to be careful with how you, how you kind of react those out. This is by far the most important part of my job, is free bodies, especially doing hand analysis. I have learned that FEM is more prominent now in some of the other industries, especially uh, automotive, um, there's some other, um, I think uh, oil, they're doing a lot of FEM analysis with the, well, their pipelines and, and the like and their drilling rigs. But in aircraft, we still use a lot of hand analysis and a lot of legacy methods is what they call them because they're still accurate. They're very easy to use, and if you understand how to use them, you're gonna know more about the structure. So just remember, it's always easier than you think. And the last thing is it has to be completely balanced. So always remember that. So in load paths, um, this one's kind of wordy. You can read through that a little bit, but really, what I'm trying to get here is that load travels in the direction of least resistance, okay? In structure, what's resistance? Stiffness, okay? So K equals P over delta. So how much does something deflect based on some load I give it? So we make this analogy here, V equals IR, voltage equals current times resistance. So of course, at a constant voltage, a lower resistance, you have higher current. So again, least resistance, more current, less resistance. Same thing here. This is just stiffness. P equals K times delta. Same thing as K equals P over delta. Just rearrange. So for a constant load, the lower the stiffness, the higher the deflection. Higher deflection means lower load. Uh, so load follows stiffness. Key point there. Load follows stiffness. Remember that at all times because when we do some of these free bodies, you may find that you think something's going to be reacted somewhere when it's not. And the reason why is because of stiffness and the capability of the structure. So first example here, another box beam for you with torque on it. Okay, so it's still going to be a cantilever beam essentially with a torque applied to it. So what I want to show you here is how 
I actually analyze this and break it out to think about it in terms of what's going on in the model, the load path of the model. So, excuse me. This torque actually can be written in a different way. Does anybody see how we can rewrite that torque on the face of that box? Yeah, so we can basically write it as a shear in each one of those, I guess, legs of the box, as you call it, as, as you see. So there's the box again. So we draw in these shears. So essentially, this is the same thing right here, right? So see this? This is a couple here and a couple there. So it's just two couples, okay? So see how that gets reacted out the base? So now I'll give you another question. <laughs> this actually came up one time. I got a C beam now. So a little different than the box beam. Same applied torque, same values. Now, how are we gonna apply or equivalence this torque onto the C beam? Turns out this is what we have to do. The reason why is because it's an open section and open sections don't like torsion. And why is that? If you ever torque on an open section, the thing's gonna bend. I mean, it's very weak. Again, it's stiffness, right? So it's gonna deflect a lot. So what happens is there's a, a term or a type of analysis called differential bending, okay? So differential bending, what that means is you have some type of torque being applied, and the only way for the structure to react that out is through bending, which if you look at this load here, all the way to that load, that's bending in the strong axis of this top flange, and essentially the same thing in the lower axis of that flange, right? So very simple to do this. Now there's more going on than this, just this, okay? But this is the major load path of the structure, right? And so if you notice, again, um, this one is a balanced free body, but at points in here, you may get an unbalanced free body just to kind of prove a point. So a key thing here, when we learn about our equations, torque is related to shear, right? So if we look at our, our uh, a single element and we break it down, Typically, a torque is just going to give us an element of pure shear. If we look at that, that's what we get. So if you look at this element here, and you rotate it up into this guy right here, when we just shrink down this box to be infinitesimally small, what happens is this load and this load are right here. Looks like I drew them opposite, but they're right there. So now I have this element. It's got a couple on it, like this. So now I have to balance that out, and it looks like I drew these arrows in the wrong direction. So I apologize for that. These should be going in this direction, this direction. right? So it, it's a it's a shear. It's an element of pure shear. I'll make a note to fix that for future reference. So another load path example here. There's kind of a lot going on in this picture. So again, think about the structural thought process that we go through. We go through our geometry, our loading, and our reaction, and it doesn't make sense. So I drew the geometry up for you. So let's try and understand this. Um, to give you some perspective, a lot of times, this is just a, we take a cut of the actual structure here. This is continuous structure, right? Uh, this right here has to be the edge of the part, or EOP as we like to call it, because there's structure here that's in the way that's being fastened to. So it's kind of hard to, I guess, convey that through how, I, how I've drawn it, but. Essentially, these are internal loads of the parts, okay, right? And that little blue load up there is just balancing it out. So this is actually a little bit easier one. Um, I had to do one the other day that was actually much more difficult. It had probably about three different plates on a single fastener, and I had to figure out where the load was going in each plate and why. So what are we going to start with? We have to figure out how it's reacting. So in structures, when you have complex things like this, with a lot of things being attached and fastened together and interacting and contacts, always take the path of least resistance. So what that means is start where you make no assumption. Start where you only have one unknown in your equation. And again, we're gonna apply F equals MA equals zero. So we have to have a balance, right? So if we look at this skin, right? So we have an internal shear, that's what that arrow represents, and we have an internal axial load in this direction. So how are we gonna react this out on the skin? Where, where's our reaction at to react those internal loads? Any guesses? So 
So these X's are fasteners, essentially. That's where they're attached to. So where are we going to react the load out? In the fastener, right? So that's the only place where you can react these out. Um, turns out you can react things out, uh, which we'll get into um, when things contact. We have what's called heel-toe. Uh, in fasteners, we have what's called socket action. It's where you actually get a moment through a thickness um, based on contact. But in this case, we'll keep it simple. And we react those out. So again, we started with the simple guys right here to come up with our, our reaction. Because there's only there's only one place for that load to go. It's through the fastener. There's nowhere else for it to go. Right? Whereas if we were to look at this intersection, I got one load here, I got fasteners here, which are gonna have some kind of load on them. I got fasteners here which have some kind of load on them. I don't know what the loads are on any of these fasteners. And this attaches to this structure, this attaches to that structure, and these attach to that structure. So how am I gonna figure out where this load gets distributed to? Well, that's gonna be a pretty hard question. So that's why we start these areas where we only have a single place for the load to go, because that's where the load has to go. And we have confidence in that. So then we do equal and opposite when it comes to fasteners and splices, right? So we know a fastener load here, but it has to be equal and opposite here to balance the fastener, right? So then we can actually go into this more complicated structure that has multiple parts of being a fastener to and say, I got a faster load here, got a faster load here, got an axial load here, and now there's only one place for that to go, and that's through the red fasteners there. So I like to color coordinate my free bodies because that lets me know what forces actually is because if you were to start putting numbers in here, there's and you come back to it even a week later, there's no way you're gonna remember, oh yeah, I got that from a step. I got that from a load chart. There's just no way you're gonna remember it versus I got that because I added these forces and subtract these ones off and divided by two because it's an even distribution. Completely different and you're not gonna remember how that happened. So what I like to do is I like to put my applied loads in some type of a color, in this case blue, um, that I have being applied to the structure. Then my reactions, as I call them, I, I go with another color. So in this case, I did red. Then I say, what are my equal and opposites? Purple. Then I say, what are my final loads that give me the exact balance that matches my applied loads? And I label those green. Green because I know that, hey, go ahead, you have a balanced free body. Until I get that those are green, I'm not gonna move forward. Now, how do I check this to make sure it's balanced? Well, you do have to check each individual structure, otherwise it will not balance. Now, in theory, you could check three of the four, and if those balance, the fourth one has to balance. But it's always best practice to check all your structure, to make sure it's balanced properly. So, in this case, what I typically would do is I would only pull these applied loads out here, the shears and the three axials. That axial load that's up here, I would not pull out of, if it's my fem or my load table, I would not use. What I would do is I would come up with these green arrows here, these reactions, I would sum those up. And if those equal that blue arrow from wherever, you know, I got my loads from to be applied, that means I got a balanced free body, okay? So in this case, there's something that I missed. And what that is, is moments and eccentricity, right? So thickness of plates, they could be different thicknesses, you're causing moments to happen. When we do free bodies like this, typically neglect those. There's some cases where you have to apply them, and that really just comes from engineering judgment. So in this case, it's actually pretty symmetrical if you look at it. Especially this piece here, in terms of same fasteners on each side, they're probably spaced the same. This T is probably the same width on each side. These guys are symmetric. So more than likely, there's not gonna be a lot of induced moment in there. The difference is this arrow is probably acting at some centroid of the section. And if this is a continuous web, which in our case it's not, we have to be able to calculate what the effective web length is to come up with this T section to apply this load at the centroid. So I have seen analysis done when that takes that into account. Typically it's a more critical analysis where we, we know it's a heavy loading. Maybe it's a new design, maybe it's new structure, maybe it's new loads. And so uh, we, we go from there. So 
result. There's no question so far on any of that. The last example is probably one of the more difficult ones. I've got a drawn over there and over here. I have an applied load there on the tip. I have three fasteners I can react this out of to get it into this structure. I have these two here and that one up there. Notice their orientations are different. The one on the top is going in the vert vertical direction. These two here are coming in the lateral direction. So I'll get into stiffness here in a second. Well, basically we have to react these out for our fasteners here. Now the reason why is because this load more than likely is not going to go into tension in a fastener if it has a shear load path through a fastener. So um, shear is the most is the stiffest load path. So shear will always that's kind of how we start. We react everything in shear that we possibly can. So that's shear in these fasteners here. Applied shear, so it makes sense, right? Now somehow. Remember this is basically just a cantilevered beam, just like we've been talking about all day. I have to react some moment out, right? Because I have a tip load on there. So, explain why there's no tension load there. The next thing is, where does the moment get reacted? So this is why I drew this up here. But uh, basically, let's talk about this for a sec. Down, down. Okay, so we have those reactions in there. Notice always, I'll draw reactions with the slash film. It's another way for people to tell that it's a reaction. And then we have to figure out somehow this guy is going to induce a moment like this. So we have to react it out the opposite way, right? So what are our chances to do that? Well, we have three interfaces here. And luckily, they're spaced apart to where we have some eccentricity. Eccentricity is just a moment arm. So what's actually going to happen is so again we're applying a like this so we have to come the opposite way so you would think what would happen is you'd get a load there now where's the only other place for that load to be reacted out turns out it's in tension through these passages now there is a potential we don't know what the distribution of the actual load value is yet but there is a potential for this part here. Maybe uh, if it rotates about these fasteners, and now you have a contact down here, or sorry, up here because you're bending it up. So this flange now is pushing against the web of this guy. Okay, so now maybe we have a contact reaction going on up here that we have to, now we have to look at this flange with basically a distributed load on it and then fastener load. That becomes pretty complex. So one thing I want to point out here, this doesn't happen. This will not take shear load in that fastener. Does anybody have an idea why? It's, it's not, it's kind of difficult to tell. You kind of have to have a bigger picture of the structure. But the reason why is because if I have a load here, I have to have an equal and opposite load through this Z angle. If I look at a cross section of this Z angle, So I'm probably going to have something like this, right? Now I'm going to have a fastener here. I'm going to have a fastener here. If I pull on this Z angle, I'm going to have to react it out here and it's faster. Now what's going to happen? This is eccentric loading. So there's a moment that's going to happen. So what I actually, I actually did this was I took a section cut right here at this corner and uh, basically said section AA, right? If we take a section cut, it's just gonna look like this. It's a rectangular plate. Flat plate bending is not good. We do not like that at all. So it turns out that the capability of that fastener is 10 pounds. It can't take load. And the reason why is because this backup structure section has no capability. So, you know, I went to my lead and said, hey, you know, I determined what the load in this fastener is. It's zero. It can't take any load. It's just not gonna happen. So you know, then we got into, okay, how are we actually going to react it out? And, uh, you know, we, we had a problem area in this joint. So then we could say, well, we know there's no load there, so we don't have to worry about this issue we're having. So, again, that's something else we consider is capability. It's the capability of the backup structure. Because if we react it out that way, it doesn't necessarily mean the structure can take it. And that's what we have to look for. So stiffness. Uh, talked about this before, but basically the order of stiffness 
in terms of highest to lowest is shear axial and bending. So when we look at a structure and we're reacting load through structure, we're always going to react it through shear and then axial and then bending. It's just how it works, right? Because if you think about it, in class you learn bending deflections get pretty big. When you have a bunch of structure put together, it's not going to deflect a lot because the whole thing would have to deflect. So load follows stiffness. Again, just the definition of stiffness there. This is actually in Dr. Sinspire's class. He derived this for you. It's a FEA, basically, how you come up with your stiffness matrix in finite element analysis for an axial member. Start with our definition of stress. E's e times strain. Another definition of stress for applied load is P over A. And then strain is just delta over L. Combine those equations, rearrange, and look at the equation we get. E equals K delta. K in this case, A E over L. Very simple, very straightforward. We actually use this all the time. So that's how we come up with stiffness for members. We actually use that in hand analysis to do some load distribution stuff by hand instead of using a FIM to say, okay, I got 59% of the load goes here, and I got 41% that goes over here. So fasteners, probably about 70% of I guess structural analysis deals with fasteners. There's tens of thousands on these. Uh, Dr. Sinsmeyer pointed this out. Fasteners, uh, they can be basically very easy to analyze if we install them properly in the same way every time. We have some standards for that. They can be pretty difficult to analyze in terms of you can do bolt bending, you can have a lot of gaps, you can have a lot of plates going on there. Um, again, like I said, not only are is really the only way to capture a fastener analysis. So if you notice up there, I did make up that number 70%. But it's pretty accurate. The majority of what I do is, is faster analysis. And that's where you can make yourself a great engineer or a terrible engineer. So faster failure modes, real quick, we'll go through this. Looks like we're getting short on time. And I want to touch on what I kind of do on a daily basis for you guys. But essentially, uh, I think we learned this in structures too, I want to say. You learn about faster failure modes. So you notice if you have a fastener with a load on it, you got the edge of the part here, there's three main ways that it's going to fail. That's in shear of the fastener, so there's a shear plane there. A bearing of the plate, which is due to essentially your fastener is stronger than your material, so it pushes the material out of its way. Gives you an elongated hole. And then there's also shear out, where you actually shear along these planes in the plate. So in aircraft, we want fasteners and joints to be bearing critical. The reason why is because they'll redistribute load at that point. So what that means, <clears throat> this fastener is going to get loaded up. It's going to start bearing. It's going to start deflecting and causing an elongated hole. The, around, the surrounding fasteners are going to take up the additional load that is being applied. And then those fasteners will start bearing. So now you have yielding going on, which is OK. We do have requirements for when it can do, when it can't do. But think about it like this. If I had a fastener in there, that fastener loaded up and it's sheared. Now, 100% of the load that was in that fastener now has to be distributed to the other fasteners. Chances are that, that fastener is shear critical, the surrounding fasteners are shear critical. We have what's called zippering when that happens. So literally, one fastener will fail and the rest will just pop right off and your plate just completely separates. And you hear a bunch of popping going on. So we don't want that. We want bearing cover. So a faster free body, <laughs> this is kind of the general free body we apply to fasteners. Um, I don't think we go over this here uh, in class at all in, in anything, so I wanted to touch on it real quick because it's pretty important to what we do. So what actually happens due to the eccentricity of the plates, you get a tension at the head and a tension at the tail with this small moment arm there. So you induce tension load into that fastener. Tension in a fastener is not good. Fasteners are designed to carry shear, not tension. We do have tension applications, but we avoid them. Again, shear is a stronger load path. So if we rotate that fastener over, what's this starting to look like? It's starting to look like a beam. So a beam with the two distributed loads, a couple long reactions on there. The fasteners are just beams with loads being applied to them. Now, it's very complex and not linear because this is actually a plate and a contact, but we can't idealize it into just a load. So, that's essentially what this says up there is 
you just have a circular section beam, shear and moment distributions, you have an induced axial load. Now you have axial bending and shear going on in that faster that you have to account for in your margin of safety. So in the day-to-day -day work, what I actually worked on, I guess, was there any questions about some of that? Went through faster, probably a little faster than I wanted to, but that's all right. So day-to-day -day work, this is probably more important where students are gonna to wanna to know what I do on a day-to-day, -day, because I had no idea and I got to work and this is, this is what you do for a living. I said, okay. So hopefully this will give you guys more of an insight into, yeah, I really wanna do that, or no, I don't wanna do that. So you don't get there and you're like, well, crap, this sucks. Well, I'm gonna try and transfer. Well, I can't really transfer, nothing's going on. Don't wanna move again, go to another company. So anyways, hopefully this will help you out. So there's basically three kinds of work. There's production, redesign, new design. Um, there's also, you know, structural research, tool development, film development, um, you know, pre-contact contract wins. So you're doing more conceptual layouts, general type structural analysis, post-contract wins. You're talking production of aircraft, F-15, F-18, C-17, some of the Boeing military aircraft we have there. Then there's also development. And by development, I mean more of development of tools, analysis, methods. There's always a new tool, there's always some new method. People are still writing PhDs and structures. So in productions, we generally support customers. This is from a military perspective. Our customers are the US government. We do also have international sales. Typically those still go through our US government because they're gonna say, you can't sell F-15s to China. We don't want them to have our plane, right? So it comes down to there's actually a lot of politics involved in this. And here, what we really do is make sure requirements are being met. And this comes down to any redesigns or, I guess, any major changes we're trying to make, even early on in the process when we're still building the product. Then we have part suppliers and assembly lines. Part suppliers, pretty straightforward. Typically, those defects because the parts warped, they undercut a part, there was a thickness deviation. We have to go in and tell them, I just throw it away, which turns out parts can get expensive on aircraft especially if they're titanium. And you go to your manager and you say, I'll throw that away. And he goes, no, too bad, it costs $300,000 to make it, figure out how to make it work. And I said, what are you talking about? I don't want to make it work. This is a terrible part. And he says, figure it out. So we figured it out. Maybe it takes a month, but they didn't want to lose $300,000. They wanted to pay me a month to figure out how to fix this part, which is also part of the reason why I'm important. So uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but you do get those pressures. Assembly lines normally here, uh, we call, I call this Swiss cheese. Um, a lot of times assembly lines will drill holes where they're not supposed to be, and they'll do it all over the place. And then they call you, and you've got a fuselage that's 90% built, and you say, well, I want you to throw away these five parts. And your manager's okay with it because they're pretty cheap. It's like, we can get new ones, they're available. But then they say to get those parts out, it's gonna take a month, we're gonna to have to take it off the gym, we're gonna to have to stop assembly line. So then they say, hey, you need to figure out a way how to repair this. Then you say, okay, well, you have to scrap this part, put a new one in, do these holes this way, put in bigger fasteners here, and come up with a repair. So any questions on production? Pretty, pretty straightforward there. Redesign stuff. Basically, we take exist existing parts and assemblies, we redesign them. Um, they're more driven by cost reduction, sometimes poor original design. Uh, you know, we're not perfect, we're all human as well. We make mistakes, we find that out, and we have to go back and fix those. So that's typically where redesigns come in. We try to maintain original strength of parts. Uh, it's very difficult to do a redesign without gaining weight, especially on an aircraft like F-15 because back in the 80s, it was very cheap to build sheet metal parts and assemblies. It was expensive to do machines. Completely opposite now. It costs more money to do built up sheet metal than machines. So we convert to machines, well sheet metal can get down to 032 thick, sometimes thinner. You can't machine something that thin. If you do, it's gonna be wobbly. And chances are, your, your tolerance band, it's gonna cost way more. So just not possible. So we do gain, weight when we go through this. But the key is to make sure you maintain the load and the stiffness. It's kind of what we look for. We don't want load to deviate too much. We want it to stay in that part because that's what it was designed to. 
So new design, this is kind of post-conceptual layout type stuff. Uh, it's referred to as clean sheet. You're doing train studies, you're looking at materials, you're looking at thicknesses, you're looking at how things interfaces, you're looking at kind of the design, I guess, criteria. The assembly and tooling issues come up and they have to be solved. Um, the last thing there, people always want to put holes in your parts because airplanes aren't wireless yet. Um, also fuel lines, all kinds of crazy stuff. You'll always be asked to make Swiss cheese of your parts. So know that ahead of time. You're gonna have to put holes somewhere and you're not gonna like it. The chances are they're gonna force you to make it work as opposed to rerouting in a different direction. I think that's all the slides I have for you unless there's any questions. We're right at the 1130 mark. So I think it's lunch now, so don't have to worry about anybody pushing us out. But any questions? No? Yeah. Do you spend some time in, in the labs uh, building these parts, these redesigns and verification and then testing them to see what happens? So there is, some, there is some testing that goes on. Uh, typically we have our own testing departments. So we have uh, what they call test and evaluation engineers, and they are the structures guys. They're the ones who actually do build the parts. They put strain gauges on them. They come up with wiffle trees. They load them up and test them. Um, I've recently been told we do have budget to do it ourselves, but we still would basically come up with more with the test plan and then we would give that to the test evaluation engineer who would oversee the mechanics who actually build it in the shop and put it together and test it. So it does happen. It's pretty rare on like F-15 because I mean the thing's old and maybe not selling anymore. They don't want to put too much more money into it, but I'm definitely on new design, if they're making changes to stuff, they'd love to test. And actually I, I believe there's, a, especially where we're at, there's a lot of test and evaluation engineers for that reason because we just need a lot of them and we found the value in testing is just really high. Even though it's expensive, the value that we get back from it is, is far greater than any cost. Anything else? So you're more into the conceptual of doing that, all the equations on paper Yeah, uh, most of the time, so uh, there in St. Louis, we do have an assembly line for the F-15. We, we build a lot of parts, we have final assembly there. So I can go in, go out and look at the parts uh, to get kind of a whereabout. In production, what I really do is people mess up parts, we're all human, they put cuts in bad places, they put holes in bad places. So really what I do is come up with a solution to those problems, and then I apply equations to them. I actually spend most of my time writing reports than I do analysis because the analysis has been done for so many years, oftentimes I'm just updating an analysis, right? It takes me a couple hours. Well, it takes me about six hours to write the report of and document it. You could be a bad engineer and document it in an hour, but I guarantee you some people are gonna be pretty upset with you if they ever come back. And then now, you've made a name for yourself of being kind of the sloppy engineer who doesn't document his work. So, Unfortunately, there is a lot of documentation in engineering, uh, which is why we take the, the technical writing class, uh, which is very helpful. But yeah, I, I definitely use more equations and stuff. I do some film work. It is necessary. Um, most of the film work I've done is all P-level solvers, so it's actually solid models using tent elements and going in, pulling stresses, uh, pulling stress gradients like, through thicknesses of parts and then doing a fatigue analysis based on a spectrum I get from our fatigue engineers. So there is actually quite a bit of analysis being done in FEM, especially now if, if something's really complex, we're gonna build a FEM. We just know that there's so much going on there, we can feel more comfortable in a FEM type application or analysis. What kind of fatigue analysis do you so we kind of, F-15, I'll talk to kind of how we do it, is it's a little different than some of the other, I guess, applications you can use. Um, we have a fatigue group who really handles all fatigue analysis, especially detailed stuff. Uh, they actually will go in and grow a crack and come up with a light. Um, they'll do some other things like that. It's pretty detailed and they'll play around with spectrums, uh, fatigue spectrums that we have. 
from my perspective, really what I do is most of the time the fatigue we're looking at are holes, fastener holes. So we have typically, um, we'll have a fastener hole. So looking narrow, we'll, we'll basically have a, have a plate with a hole in it. And then we'll have some type of a bearing on here. It doesn't have to be here, it can be rotated in any way. Uh, you can have some type of a through stress going on here or here here um, and then what we do is my job is to come up with what these loadings are uh, I run a, a FEM we have a tool that we use to run a FEM to come up with our peak KT Sigma and say it's at this point on the hole and then what we'll do is we pull a stress gradient from here to the edge of the part. And we use that stress gradient in another tool that takes into account our spectrums that were developed by our fatigue team. And then we have to go in and manually input okay, materials, dimensions, and the like. And then what we do is we have certain requirements for crack initiation, crack growth, and total life. And we basically come up with lives or margins themselves to meet our criteria. Does that make sense? Can you talk about like switch cheeses that means yep. you need to make a lot of cutouts, not necessarily for fastener, right? right? For other things as right. well. Yep. Um, is this some, you know, like the, the stress, the load path will change completely yes. after you cut out. Yes. And I know that we, we, we don't discuss that in structures right. uh, in the one or two. Do you think it's important or you can learn it on the job? I think you can learn that more on the job. Um, I think more of the key is to kind of learn some of the more basic stuff with, uh, you know, it's all to learn about beams because we really idealize it in the beams. Like if, if this was an edge of a part right here, I've actually, I've had people come in and, and they talk to me about it. You can't idealize this section here as a beam and with a, with a loading and a through load on there and actually, uh, we got pretty complex on me with it. So that could be important to kind of talk about that Maybe just mention, you know, that hey, you know, if there's a hole somewhere, the load's got to go around it, so you have to figure out how. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we definitely learn more on the job with that because typically it's very specific to hole size, hole location, and loading. So uh, probably pretty difficult to kind of cover all the time. Yeah. What kind of books or resources or documents you have that you yes, use a lot to talk about that? Yeah. So we have internal documents we use. Um, they are pri pri proprietary based on text and, and equations. But we also use a lot of reference textbooks. Uh, we use uh, Broom, uh, Structural Design, uh, which I mean, Broom's pretty much a standard across the industry from what I've been told. Uh, we use Michael New. Uh, which actually he stole a lot of his material and then published it internationally. Um, he actually took some material from Lockheed and published it that was proprietary. Um, it's called the Lockheed Bathtub Fitting Analysis. Um, well, he does have good stuff in there. Uh, it's just um, it's still kind of a standard that most people have heard about. We use, a, I think it's Stress and Strain by Rourke. Just uh, basically a bunch of tables of equations for uh, different columns with different loadings, different beams with different loadings, different holes. Basically, just a bunch of uh, kind of charts you can go and pull an equation out of and then work with. Then we also use uh, Peterson stress concentrations um, to look up those if we're doing a hand in the fatigue analysis. And one more. So I've seen more advanced topics. Um, we'll do uh, Timoshenko has a couple books, and but those are pretty advanced and most of the time he's referenced in Rourke and New. So his are more of theory, like I think he has a really good place in Shell's book. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, those, but Brun and New are really the top two Rourke on occasion. Yeah. Which the plan is, uh, I was going to develop this presentation a little bit further too to talk about some of the references and the like. Because it turned out I actually bought the room here. Um, I think I had Tom Galley's design class, and he put it on the recommended list. 
never opened it here, got to work, and they're like, oh yeah, we use Broom. And I was like, what do you mean, this is a big book I've never opened before? And they said, yeah, that's it. Man, you got a copy? And you know, all the other new hires didn't have one, so got kind of lucky with it. Any other questions? Talk about anything else now. Uh, I got other experiences of Boeing too, non-structural. Nothing too cool though, unfortunately. You know, I'm in a basement at work, so no windows. I think we have air conditioning that kicks on at seven or eight in the morning. But until then it's you know 80 degrees. <coughs> Alright. Well, I think that's it. for Boeing out there, so that makes it a little different in terms of if you go to like SoCal, there's a lot of companies out there, so they're always competing, so they're typically paying more, they're interested more in retaining talent, um, acquiring talent from the other companies, mm -hmm. so, but I, I don't think that's anything new, you know, for St. Louis or the Donald Douglas Bays, it's just I think they've realized it a little bit more now and when it comes to cost cutting and stuff like that. They're, they know they're in St. Louis, so they know they may have a little bit more flexibility with with how they go about cutting those costs. So, but yeah, I, I can't complain. Taking care of you there is, it's 
taken quite a bit of time though with becoming recognized there in Boney and St. Louis. Very difficult, especially in the program I'm in because it's kind of a lot of new guys are brought on to F15 to kind of train up. And then they send them to Phantom Orange, uh, some of the new development programs, and research technology. And so until you get to that point, you're not really given the opportunity and the freedom to show what you can do. Like you're, you're pretty leashed for a while in terms of what you know, let you. And again, that comes down to your lead too and your manager. But for the most part, everyone I've worked with has been fairly leashed um, in terms of what they've allowed me to do. But as I've kind of performed, they definitely loosen up and let you do what you can do. It's a little longer. Right. <laughs> Right. Three years is still just a beginning. Exactly, and, that, and that's the other thing too. It's still, um, it just takes a long time. That's just it. We've been, we've been doing engineering and building planes for decades. So you know, I think that's the other shocker is you can't go into industry and like, I'm an aerospace engineer now, so I know everything. A lot of people do, and a lot of people think they deserve promotions. And, Opportunities, responsibility, leadership roles right out of college. I think they're kind of shocked, especially coming here because we do have so many opportunities and really you can go as far as you want to go. And I think that all of you guys are very good at letting students do that in terms of studies, uh, research, extracurricular type, you know, helping with the students develop and learn and get into what they want. So that was one thing I noticed when I got out. I was like, well, I want to go do this for the next couple of days. All right, we can't do that. Why not? Well, you got to get this done. It's like, but I could do this and then get it done, and then I'd be faster at doing this every time I have to do it until I retire. I don't know. We don't have time for that. So, yeah. We don't have time to save time. Right. So, you talked about what you do day to day now, right? Do you ever see a time in your future where you might be doing this for your day-to-day -day job? Teaching? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Definitely, and I've thought about it more for, you know, retirement down the road kind of type. With. Once you make all your money in industry. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you'll take your poor teaching job just to kill time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and get those summer vacations. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've thought about it. Time. It's a... Uh, I think the biggest hurdle for me right now is the PhD aspect of it, which, um, especially while working, doing the masters has been very difficult. Um, I quickly found out here, I just, I excelled. I did very well. I got into a master's program. I you know, expected the same experience and I was quickly getting C's on tests and failing tests. And it was like, what happened? <laughs> and I realized it was a combination of things, but. Working 40 hours a week in a critical thinking job doesn't help your ability to think for two hours in a lecture from six to eight. So there was that aspect, and then also with the amount of material you cover and the broad material that you cover in terms of, here's 10 theorems, here's a homework, let's do tomorrow. We're not doing any examples. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm gonna you know, not sleep tonight so I can do this homework and then go to work for eight hours and do it all again the next day. Ah, I think I'm okay with if I just get 90% of these problems done. I don't need 100 on this assignment. <laughs> I quickly found that out too. It's just like, yeah, the 100% the days are gone. It's just not worth it. So, But we'll see if after this continues, because I've been talking with people at Bowling and just have more connections with the industry and they would be able to do work for Bowling that lines up with a thesis that then once upon finishing that work for Boeing it becomes my thesis and then I go to a university take the classes and defend and get the PhD. Maybe get some time off to do that so you're yeah, not so working I, 40 hours. I would have to take a leave of absence to, to do that portion. So. Yeah. And if I do, uh, I've thought about coming back here too just because I like the West and I like the
course, one you would have to retire, or the school would have to get bigger. We're, we're, we're growing. We've been hiring. And ultimately, I know. I, I've heard 20 years from now, when he's ready to retire, some, some, some have a spot to for it. We won't some people have been retired in right. Right. several <laughs> years. You yeah. know? So this year, we're trying to hire five faculty. Yeah, that's what they're saying. Yeah. So. I don't know if we'll get all five. Well, we, we're, we're probably going to hear on the, the last two offers on Monday, I think. We have two more offers outstanding? Two, uh, two offers outstanding. Yeah. Yes. The, who was the, the last one? Todd. Okay. Oh, you've been offered to him too? I've heard that. Interesting. Okay. Oh, there's a there's a tool that we use to install fast and it's called Quack Push. That's what it is. Yeah, I don't think it's there. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. They just I think it it's just some yeah, they, or they, they call it a piggyback quack. Yeah. It's, this, it's a big old thing that they, they uh, there's kind of a, a bushing and a drill blanket, mm -hmm. and they have a kind of tip on the drill. And, uh, it's got two steel pins, and you push it into the bushing and twist it to lock it. And I mean, this thing is like four foot long and like 40 pounds hanging off this drill blanket, and it uh, automatically drills holes for complex holes and taper locks and stuff. So they have to, they don't like drilling the taper locks by hand. They get so messed up. So. Lots of parts for you to do something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately, yes. But, yeah, very cool. Next 45 is a four is one, too. There's a lot of cool stuff. I was hoping for more stories about it. Servitude before you wipe out the debt. Oh, yeah. 